my honor to introduce the Honorable Richard J. Loftus, Jr. We haven't known each other long. Uh, two minutes. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, um, Judge Richard Loftus. Judge Richard Loftus is the chair of the Mental Health Issues Implementation Task Force. He was a member of the Task Force on Criminal Justice Collaboration on Mental Health Issues from 2009 to 2011. He's a past presiding, he's, excuse me, he is the past presiding judge of the Superior Court of Santa Clara County. Judge Loftus was appointed in 1998 and has served in both the civil and criminal courts. He was the supervising judge of the family court and supervising and presiding judge of the juvenile court. While in ju juvenile court, he presided over the first juvenile mental health court and was actively promoted the, and actively promoted the establishment of courts throughout the nation. He has served on numerous judicial council committees, including vice chair of the presiding judge's advisory committee, working group on criminal justice realignment, judicial branch leadership budget group, AB 1208 ad hoc legislative committee, judicial recruitment and retention working group, and the CJER faculty. He received his BA and MA from the University of Dest Detroit and his Juris Doctorate from the University of Michigan. And one thing not on this list was that I found interesting, he worked for three years for General Motors at the plant where they built Corvettes. With that, I, uh, I introduce uh, Judge Richard Loftus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, thank you very much, Dennis, for that introduction. And uh, uh, he's correct. Uh, this is a tough act to follow, uh, but I think uh, pertinent and important in terms of setting the tone for today's uh, meeting. Um, I want to thank Mary for her courage in terms of coming up here and talking about herself. And Marcus, I believe you are an A student. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the association for inviting me to come today, uh, Sandra and uh, the staff. Uh, Alice and the IT staff and Stacy, et cetera, for uh, allowing us to do this today. Uh, I'm not quite used to having this light shine in my face. I know they're videotaping this, but I'm going to probably have some challenges reading my notes. I'm not used to having a light uh, sh shine at me this way. Uh, so if I struggle a bit, uh, you'll understand I know. Typically in the courtroom, I don't have a problem with having people pay attention to what I say. Uh, those few that do sometimes, I ask them to talk with the bailiff, that person in the uniform that has the gun, and uh, they, they have an ability to remand them if they're not paying attention, so uh, that's not usually a problem. Uh, but I would like to talk a little bit about uh, some of the points that were made earlier in terms of the presentation. Uh, I think it is clear that there's a connection between mental illness and substance abuse. Uh, the people that we see that are mentally ill, uh, about 75 to 80 percent of them have some substance abuse issue, and certainly that's an integral part of treating the people who have mental illness. Um, and, and Mary talked about it being hand in hand uh, with the issues that she had to deal with. So she's right about that. Uh, what I'd like to do, though, b b as we begin, is to talk about what we already know. Uh, what we know is that California criminal justice system is becoming increasingly responsible for large numbers of individuals who have mental illness. Uh, in the general population, about, and these are statistics that other people can cite, and depending upon how you define it, et cetera, the numbers may be different, but in the general population, about 5.7% of the general population have a serious mental illness. About 18.5% of the California arraigned individuals have uh, a serious mental illness, and according to the Department of Corrections, California Department of Corrections, about 23% of the people in California prisons, ha inmates, they have a serious mental illness. Now, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 56% of those people who are in the criminal justice system have some issue with mental illness and have uh, either experienced uh, professional assistance or have some kind of symptom in the last 12 months. So certainly mental illness is an integral part of the criminal justice system in California. Annually, 
Another thing we know is that about 120,000 people are released from custody each year. Uh, of those, about 25 to 30 percent of these have mental illness. Uh, we have traditionally not ver done very well uh, with that population. What do we mean by serious mental illness? Well, the definitions vary, uh, but serious mental illness certainly is uh, brain conditions that have a genetic component, major depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, severe anxiety disorders, severe ADHD, developmental disabilities, uh, including pervasive development disorder, mental retardation, autism, and organic brain syndromes, which include severe head injury. Uh, all of those are serious mentally, uh, mental illness issues that we have. What we also know is, is that the recidivism rate has traditionally been about 65 to 70 percent in three years for people coming out of the prison system, but for people with mental illness, it's twice that high. Now, there's some things that have changed. And since uh, we talked a little bit about, and I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, task force on collaboration uh, with regard to the criminal justice system and, and the work that it did and the recommendations that it's made. Uh, but recently, we also know that there have been some significant changes in, in the way the criminal justice system in California is going to work. We, we've had realignment and all of the implications of that. We have reentry and the imp implications of that with regard to people who have mental illness. And, and finally, we have mandatory supervision, which is a whole new idea that we have to deal with in terms of what that means for people with mental illness. We also know that the incompetent to stand trial has overwhelmed the state mental health hospital system. We know that we have way too many. We don't know what to do with them. And we know that it costs about $200,000 a year in order to put somebody in a state hospital that has a mental health problem. Individuals, we also know that individuals with mental illness typically spend more time in custody than others with similar conditions. Uh, this is a problem for us because if you're a judicial system, you want to have fairness, even-handedness, and having people be tr treated justly in terms of the system. We don't do that. Uh, we have not done a good job in that traditionally. This is an issue of civil rights and something that we need to fix. Now, you've often heard that the L.A. County Jail and I'm, uh, is the largest mental health facility in the world. Cook County is now claiming that uh, dubious title. Uh, Rikers, by the way, is also in play with regard to that. They claim that 40 percent of their 12,000 inmates are also mentally ill, and therefore there's a, uh, uh, a contest, I guess, uh, for that distinction. We also know that in 1950, 0.67% of Amer American adults with mental illness were either held in jails or mental institutions, and 75% were in mental institutions. Today, 97% are in jail or in prison. So what did we do about this? Well, uh, several years ago, uh, back in 1990, uh, two, rather in 2007, uh, the uh, uh, Judicial system recognized, and the, actually the Council of State Governments recognized, that we really were doing a very poor job with regard to the people who have mental illness in the criminal justice system, not only here in California, but throughout the United States. And therefore, they asked that states, seven states that were pilot programs, take a look at this and, and study it and come up with some recommendations how to change that, what we already know. Uh, what happened was, is that the Judicial Council appointed a task force to do that. The task force on uh, criminal justice collaboration in the mental health system. Uh, that task force uh, appointed 42 people whose job it was to study how we deal with people with mental illness and substance abuse co-occurring disorders in the criminal justice system and make recommendations to change it and to improve it. Uh, the Task Force on Criminal Health Collaboration and Mental Health Issues began its work in 2008. It met many times. It had studied. It was a, a collaboration that included members representing the Department of Mental Health, Department of Health Directors, Mental Health Directors, rather sheriffs, probation chiefs, Department of Corrections, National Alliance on Mental Illness, police chief, district attorneys, public defenders, disability rights, county council, and a number of judicial officers. 
It was chaired by Justice Brad Hill, uh, an appellate justice here in California. We had public hearings in Sacramento and in Los Angeles. We took input from people as to what those recommendations should be. We had draft recommendations. There were 100, 874 comments and 66 commentators. They were generally supportive of the recommendations that we made. We made 137 different recommendations, broad-based, that were based upon lots of different things. Community-based services, enhanced case processing, policies and procedures at correctional facilities, community supervision, juvenile practices, and education. Uh, we uh, published those in uh, 2011, and uh, uh, the Judicial Council adopted them. Uh, we, uh, we are looking to change the way we do justice for people with mental illness and with co-occurring disorders. Uh, the, uh, at, at the time that they were adopted by the Judicial Council, uh, they appointed a, a new task force, that's the one that I chair, the Mental Health Issues Implementation Task Force, and that our job, uh, our charge was to find a way of putting these recommendations into place. Now this is a tall task. Uh, as you can see, since the 1950s, uh, we have, as a society, incarcerated many people who have mental illness. Changing that system is not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a process. It's going to take time, and it's going to take a lot of education and a lot of issues that need to be dealt with, including the overwhelming stigma there is to mental illness. Uh, so the judges, there's 13 judges who have been appointed to this implementation task force. Uh, we've sat in, and by the way, five of them are here today uh, who are on that task force uh, attending this conference today. Uh, and we've determined that we were going to do it in two phases. The first phase is a phase to get the judicial branch in order, try and make some changes that we could do implementation within our own purview, to change those things within the branch that would help make this thing more feasible. The second phase, after we had done that, was to reach out to our justice partners and have our justice partners engage in trying to put these recommendations in place. They're comprehensive, they, and I'll, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of them and give you some examples. Uh, it's, it's important to do this, and what happened after the recommendations were made uh, was we had realignment. We had the change that happened in the justice system. So what it did then was it made these changes even more urgent. Uh, and in a way, uh, it was important that it happen at that time uh, because it's an opportunity. Changes are happening, and with those changes, these recommendations become even more important. Uh, it's a more favorable environment to adopt some of these changes, and we'll give you some examples of that as we go on. Uh, but it's important for us to take a look at some of the changes and how they might affect the mentally ill. Mandatory supervision with discharge planning, the services, how, how to deal with violations of probation in terms of doing it better than just incarceration, uh, parole supervision and having the parole uh, officers understand and know how to deal with people who have mental illness, those that are coming out of custody, uh, post-release community supervision, uh, revocation hearings, how that might work, uh, and planning for post-release community supervision. All of these changes give us an opportunity to uh, help us put into place uh, changes that, that can implement uh, si our system-wide changes. So phase one, judicial branch implementation. What have we done? Well, the task force that got appointed uh, worked to kind of identify that, uh, what, what changes we could make in terms of that. Uh, th first of all, we changed some rules of court. I'll talk about those in a moment. Uh, we uh, changed uh, the protocol for mental illness cases in our courts and what presiding judges should or could do. Uh, we had uh, uh, a change of rule of court with regard to who should be included in the regular meetings that happen in the criminal courts with regard to uh, planning and, and dealing with the criminal justice issues. Uh, we've sponsored some changes in legislation this year. The Judicial Council has adopted a couple of changes and I'll talk about those too. And judicial education, uh, I'm going to uh, identify how we've changed 
the way we're tr educating judges about mental illness and substance abuse in our uh, system. And uh, the, fi the second phase is going to be with regard to collaboration, and that's part of what we're doing here today. The uh, rule of court, the first rule of court, we changed to one with the, with the presiding judge or the criminal supervising judge in connection with the justice partners are encouraged to adopt local protocols for cases involving offenders with mental illness and or court-quoting disorders, utilizing evidence-based practices with the goal to reduce recidivism, provide better outcomes, safety, safety and costs. This is a new rule of court that went into place on January 1st, 2014. Every presiding judge in California now knows about this change of the rule of court that they should are encouraged to put into place a protocol in their own court. Now, one of the real challenges in California, and you all know this, is that we are so diverse. We are so different. Every county is different. Uh, we have Los Angeles. We have Tuolumne. We have Alpine. We have small counties. We have medium-sized counties. We have large counties. We have counties with different resources and different availability of, of uh, people and personnel and, and, and budgets. Uh, but each county has to design its own way, and each presiding judge is encouraged to do this very thing, to figure out and meet with their and put into place a protocol that deals with these issues of mental illness and co-occurring disorders in their county that fits their county's particular needs. And that's why we did it this way, and we've encouraged that. Uh, I've met with the presiding judges, all of them, and as a, as a body, they endorsed this and unanimously approved that they're going to do this going forward. The second part of that change of rule of court is to add to the regular required criminal court meetings, the county mental health director or their designee, the county alcohol and drug director or their designee, the sheriff, the police, the parole, and the conditional release programs. So now the regular criminal court meetings will not only include probation and the DA and the public defender, but now by, is required by rule of court to include these people. If this doesn't happen in your county, Go ask your presiding judge why not, because it's now a rule of court, and you're, you're going to be compelled to do that in certain places. Let me talk a little bit about judicial education and the curriculum changes that we've made. Uh, we have done a wholesale revision of the education of judges so that judges can deal with the issue that they come to, to become a judge with, and that is the stigma of mental illness. We need to tell judges what mental illness is. We need to tell judges and educate them about how to deal with people with mental illness. And we need to make sure that they have the tools to be able to deal with that. We have done that. We, uh, Judge Ramon, who is here today, is the sub-chair of our education committee and has done a masterful job of putting together a new website. Every judge will be educated. The, the judicial college that every judge is compelled to go to will teach them more about mental illness and co-occurring disorders and how to deal with that. Judges will also, on a regular annual basis, have to go to programs where they're going to learn about this. We're doing uh, programs in, in May, both at the uh, uh, Criminal uh, uh, Institute for judges that go to that, and also at the California Judges Association meeting to talk with them about people who have mental illness and these kind of issues and what you can do to, to help deal with that. We are providing them with resources and, and uh, things that they can use to, to make their work more uh, effective with regard to this. Uh, a byproduct of this education has been that there are now more criminal, uh, criminal courts that have mental health courts, and they're being created in California now because we see the need to have a separate calendar to deal with people who have mental illness. So this is a change. This is a big change in terms of how the judicial branch is responding to the need to help people with mental illness. Uh, We've also uh, sponsored some legislative changes. Uh, the legislative changes that we've uh, put into the hopper are, are two. And uh, the reason we're, we're kind of limited in this regard, uh, keep in mind that the judicial branch is not supposed to be the branch that creates laws. Uh, we're supposed to be the branch that interprets and, and, uh, and uh, in, uh, enforces them in, in certain ways. So it, we're kind of limited as to what we can do. You're not limited as to what you can do. So if there are some of these recommendations that you think uh, compel the need, and there are a number of bills that are being uh, introduced this year that have and are going to go through the process that are going to deal with some of these issues and these recommendations that I'm going to talk about in a moment, uh, uh, you're encouraged to support them 
and, and judges individually can support them, but certainly as a judicial branch, we're limited to what we can do. However, we are at least uh, proposing to um, uh, amend Welfare and Institutions Code 5354 to make available to a criminal judge the, uh, if the defendant desires, uh, the conservatorship investigation report before sentencing in a criminal case so that the judge is understanding and knowing what information there is with regard to that conservatorship. Another change that we're proposing is amending the Penal Code Section 1601 that allow the court to conditionally release an incompetent to stand trial defendant uh, in an alternative placement to allow more appropriate treatment and restoration. Uh, some of this now is going on just because we've overwhelmed the, the hospital system with regard to the incompetent stand trial. And in fact, there have been uh, programs that are being uh, tested out in different counties, San Bernardino, Los Angeles, to try and uh, do restoration locally. And uh, we support that whole idea because we think that's a better way of dealing with it rather than sending someone off to a mental uh, hospital. The second phase now is to reach out to our justice partners, which is what this is today. Uh, we want to collaborate with you. We want to work with you. We want to uh, help uh, put into place these uh, changes that we all have collectively, and keep in mind that these are changes, these recommendations are uh, the product of that uh, collaboration that we had together uh, with mental health directors and uh, drug and alcohol people and the, the uh, 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 State Department of Corrections, et cetera, uh, to put these things together. Uh, the message today from us to you is the judicial branch is on board. Uh, we're ready uh, and we're uh, interested in making a change with regard to the way we deal with people who have mental illness in the California court system. And uh, there's an immediate need uh, to deal with this issue now. And we want to do that uh, beginning now with you. Uh, how we can do that is something that you are going to have to deal with on a local level because each county is different in terms of how you do this. Uh, but uh, some of the things you can do, for example, and, and I uh, heard earlier this morning, uh, the, the issues with regard to the Medi-Cal and the ACA and some of the deficiencies, and certainly that's not a panacea by any means, but uh, it, it does offer some opportunities in terms of enrolling people who might be able to get some assistance both in terms of medication and counseling and, and other things, services that they might not otherwise get. And so each county and each presiding judge, by the way, I met with them about this as well, is encouraged to get their justice partners in their county to get those people who can enroll uh, enrolled so that they can, in fact, uh, take advantage of the services that are available. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the different recommendations that we've come up with. And, and I'm not going to go through 137 of them. That would be foolish. Uh, but uh, I do want to note that some of them have some import and they cross along uh, between us. Uh, number uh, two of our recommendations is that the uh, mental health and drug and alcohol should design and adopt integrated approaches to dealing with these kinds of issues. That is, you need to work together. And that was the recommendations that, that we recognize, and that when that happens, it makes the job of justice a little better and a little more easy in terms of that. We need to cross those traditional boundaries that sometimes, well, that's their problem and not my problem, and therefore, that's not something that I can deal with. We just need to change that. And that's one of the reasons why, in our rule of court change, what we said was, meet together. Uh, everybody ought to be in the same room talking about the same issue at the same time, and nobody can say, well, that's not, that person's not here. We need to collaborate, and that's what this conference is about, and that's what uh, we're trying to promote. Uh, the, the, another thing that is not an uncommon problem is that the judges don't know what services may be available to those people who are in front of them. So if you don't do this, we recommend you do this, and that is the presiding judge or judge designated should obtain a county mental health department's regularly updated list of local agencies that uh, utilize and accept effective practices to serve defendants with mental illness or co occurring disorders. If you don't do that, we recommend that you do. Uh, send it to them so that they know about it, and then there's an expectation that they'll use it, or hopefully. Uh, Another recommendation is mental illness information should guide the case processing. This is a sea change. This is a different way to deal with things. We want judges to do this. We want you to do this in terms of how you deal with these cases. Uh, as I said, each court now 
each presiding judge or criminal supervising judge is uh, by rule of court obligated to put into place or encouraged to put into place a protocol with regard to this kind of case and these kind of individuals. Uh, these changes uh, that they should do uh, will work. We know that mental health courts work. We have data. The studies show that they are effective, that they uh, save money, uh, that they do better outcomes, they reduce recidivism. So we know that this is a good way to go. We understand that. We need to put that into place. Uh, it's certainly uh, mental health courts are not by themselves panaceas or pr perfect, but you know what? They're better than what we have now, and it's better than what we've been traditionally doing. Recommendation number 22. Uh, there's 137 of them, so uh, <laughs> had to be selective here. Uh, judicial officers should require the development of a discharge plan. Now, this is something we got to educate judges about, and and. Uh, uh, their expectation, if we, they get this message, is that when somebody comes to them and they're doing a sentencing or they're doing a review, a violation of probation, a reentry, a re, uh, revocation hearing, uh, that if somebody has a mental health problem and they know about it, we ought to be dealing with it. It ought to be part of the driving what's going on going forward, uh, to do this in a way that is thoughtful and in the way that uh, Mary talked about in terms of her case as to what happened. That in fact they took that into account in terms of making sure that the end result was better than it would have been by, by just incarceration. So, and, and this is gonna be something you have to do collaboratively. And depending upon where the case is and what kind of case it is and what information is being provided, it should be done by the mental health staff, pretrial services, probation, parole. Everybody has to be a part of that discharge plan and we're gonna tell judges Expect that this is going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, demand it. Say that I need this in order to do my job the right way. And so that's what we're going to help to have happen in terms of this. And you'll note that uh, it, it's comprehensive and it's difficult. This is going to be hard work. There's no question about it. It's going to be harder for the judges and it's going to be harder for you. It's easier to say, gee, the midterm is and just sentence them off. That, that's easy. But to say, I want to make sure that this person has housing, I want to make sure that they have access to medication, I want to make sure that they have a play, supportive services in the community, I want to make sure that they do something that will make them successful uh, when they leave here, uh, that's more complicated, that's more difficult. And it's not going to be easy to do, but it's something that we need to do. Uh, another recommendation, 52, is that we... Uh, have to put people together, should coordinate. Uh, drug formularies have to be consistent. They have to be uh, available. They have to be uh, uh, consistent in terms of how, how people uh, deal, get them, access to them. Uh, and, and that's part of the discharge planning that has to be done in a way that's thoughtful. And you have to hold hands when you do this. If you don't do that, it's just not going to work. Recommendation 59, probation and parole conditions should be the least restrictive necessary and should be tailored to the probation or parolee's needs and capabilities understanding successful completion of, the, uh, of a period of community supervision can be particularly difficult for offenders with mental illness. This is individualized treatment and doing it thoughtfully in terms of how people will be successful because what we want to do is reduce recidivism, we want to reduce incarceration, and we want people to be more successful in, the, in their uh, work. Uh, recommendation 60, use of incentives. And, and this is something that um, is, is going to be necessary for uh, all phases. Not only will judges have to be re-educated, but probation officers and parole agents and uh, pretrial services personnel and mental health workers need to be trained to how to do this in a way that is thoughtful and considerate and take this into account. I've recently learned that uh, many of the programs that are out there do not deal with people who have mental illness in terms of how probation, for example, treats them. If your probation officers do not have a special training program for dealing with people with mental illness, you need to think about that. You need to try and uh, put that into place. Recommendation 62, services and resources for probationers with mental illness need to be identified and need to be put into place. 
a specialized treatment in probation officers, uh, 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 health office officers and parole officers, agents. They need to be trained in order to be able to do this work. Uh, we're going to train judges, and you need to make sure that the people in your uh, agency are trained as well, uh, because this is a new world and a new approach, we hope. Uh, 63 relationship between probation and parole and the community service providers. If, if your probation and parole people don't know about what services are being available to the people in your community, uh, then you have to make sure that that gap is covered. Uh, judges need to know this, and certainly the people who are making recommendations to those judges in terms of sentencing and in terms of overseeing people who are on mandatory supervision, for example, need to know what kind of services are available to people. Recommendation 75, offenders with mental illness who do not have uh, federal or state benefits. And this goes back to the issue that we talked about earlier. Mr. Uh, Sanella talked about the resource, uh, the issues and the, and the pr issues and problems with regard to coverage, uh, et cetera, under the Medi-Cal program. Uh, certainly has to be dealt with. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, a lot of these people don't have any benefits available to them and they get out of custody and they're at a C in terms of what they can do. Unless we address that, unless people get enrolled, is that not part of the discharge plan, then it should be. It should be, and I know the number of counties are addressing this, this now. Uh, there, you may have read uh, recently, the day before yesterday, there was an article in the New York Times about how this is happening throughout the United States. People who are in custody are being signed up for uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, in their different jurisdictions with their different limitations uh, in order to be able to give people access to benefits when they come out of custody or when they go into custody, uh, not while they're in, but certainly when they're not in custody, they have benefits available to them. Uh, make sure your county is following through on that if, if they're not. 76, discharge planning for offenders with mental illness. As I said, we're going to teach judges about this. We're going to have this, and they're going to create a new expectation in terms of people coming to them uh, that have mental illness or substance abuse uh, disorders in terms of what should be done. Uh, the day of the $200 and a bus ticket is over. Uh, we're going to have to do a different way, a different job of, of getting people uh, treated when, when they come together. Uh, this is a challenging work, uh, but let me tell you it's not impossible. In our county, uh, we've set up what we call a reentry center. And that reentry center has the resources in here, the housing, case management services, uh, benefits, clothing, health care, transportation, uh, available to people who come to this, this center. And uh, they're, they're learning how to deal with these folks. And why are we doing that? Because they don't go back in custody as soon. Uh, some of them fail, yes, but many of them succeed and stay out of custody and reduces recidivism. And it also is much better in terms of treating these people. It's challenging. It's expensive, and it's complicated, uh, but it's necessary. 89, every juvenile who's been referred to a probation department pursuant to Welfare and Institution Code 602 should be screened and assessed for mental illnesses as appropriate. Uh, every juvenile gets assessed uh, as they come into custody, and uh, there's, if there's an identification of a mental health issue, they should be referred to the mental health department for a, uh, assessment and evaluation so that we can do this job better. As, uh, as, uh, as Dennis indicated when I uh, was introduced, uh, I was a, a judge at overseeing the uh, first juvenile mental health court in, in California. And uh, we know that what's important is that we get these people early. If we can identify that somebody has a mental health issue when they're a juvenile, then in fact we can divert them to the mental health system as opposed to the criminal justice system. It works. It's hard work too, uh, but you know, part of this is education. Because one thing we know is, is that people who have mental health issues, once they understand that that might be what's going on, uh, they oftentimes react positively and say, yeah, now I understand. I have a mental health issue and I need to deal with that because it keeps me out of custody. It keeps me out of the criminal justice system. Uh, it's important to make sure that that's the case. We get them early. We try to divert them. Uh, and, and it's got some slightly different uh, complications and challenges uh, with regard to it in the juvenile system. Uh, but certainly we know that it's been successful. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to talk a little bit about that in the workshop in terms of what the uh, percentage of success is and how it works and, and, and why it uh, should be important in terms of uh, uh, implementation. 96, 
Existing legislation should be modified for the incompetent to, to stand trial for juveniles. Uh, we're hopeful that there will be a bill uh, passed this year that will do a better job of defining that. It's clearly overdue. Uh, it's a very challenging issue and one that needs to be addressed, and hopefully we can get that addressed this year. So what is collaboration? Well, it is uh, recognizing and understanding and cooperating. Uh, each county, as I said, is different in how you do this. Uh, there's no cookie cutter approach. You, uh, it's uh, important to customize it based upon your own particular county's needs and uh, ideas and approaches. Uh, judicial leadership is important in doing this, and that's why we put the ball in the court of the presiding judge or supervising criminal judge to con con uh, convene these meetings and make sure that people get together and talk about these things. Um, and unless people are open to this kind of a change, it's not going to happen. So you, in fact, need to make sure that you encourage this within your own sphere of influence. Uh, not all judges will immediately get on board. Uh, because it is challenging, it is more difficult, and there's a process here. This is not going to happen overnight. It took us a long time to get to where we are, but it's going to take some time to make sure that we change things. But the change has begun, and the judicial branch has indi indicated we're on board. We want to do this. We want to move forward. We, th we recognize that what we've done in the past is not good. Um, and your takeaway, we hope, today is an understanding that we are in fact ready, that we're on board, and that we want to make sure that the uh, changes occur. Uh, we will encourage that. We will continue pr to persist and, and make sure that we collaborate with you in a way that, that you need us to collaborate. Um, we want there to be a recognition that there's a need to work together, and we, we need to have a game plan. You need to have a game plan both for your own agency, for your own work, and also within your county as to what works where you are. Um, why? Why do we do this? Because, number one, it's more effective. Number two, it saves money. And number three, it's fairer and more just in terms of what we do. Um, all right, now let me talk for just a minute about what a mental health court case looks like um, and, and what it might be because it's kind of abstract otherwise. So Joe Smith is a uh, charged with a violation of Health and Safety Code Section 11377, possession of a controlled substance, methamphetamine. Uh, and uh, he is also charged with 11550 under the influence in Penal Code Section 148A1, resisting or just, uh, obstructing a peace officer. Okay, and this is a fairly uh, common drug court kind of case and uh, a relatively common case that we would see every day. He's arraigned in this case and continued for two weeks to enter a plea. He's uh, previously failed deferred entry of judgment. On the uh, plea date, his public defender advised the court that the and the district attorney that Joe Smith has had two uh, welfare and institution 5150 holes in the last year, but is currently not enrolled in a, a mental health treatment program. Since he's been in custody for 14 days, the DA offers credit for time served on the Penal Code Section 148, the obstructing case, and says that he's otherwise eligible for Proposition 36 on the other two counts. Joe pleads no low to the two uh, health and safety counts and is sentenced to Proposition 36 probation. His probation conditions, and this is where the changes begin, include an assessment by a mental health professional with a requirement that he comply with their directions in addition to the standard conditions of Proposition 36 and the monthly reviews by the court. It's otherwise the same kind of case. It's just that we have another component that we've added to it. At those reviews over a one-year period, the court receives, uh, reviews the compliance with the probation orders, including taking medication, uh, going to mental health treatment services, and that include treatment for both mental health and substance abuse. So they have to do Prop 36, but they have to do it in a way that fits their particular needs. Uh, and if they don't, you make sure that they get back on track and, and keep them in the, in the process so that they get what they need. Now, not every one of these cases is that neat, okay? Because what happens sometimes is they're homeless and they have a problem, okay, with regard to how to comply with these conditions. Or they're a vet, or they're pregnant, or 
they're not on SSI or they don't have the Affordable Care Act benefits. So what do we need then? Well, we need a case manager to help us make sure that these things go into, get into place and that those individuals get what they need in order to be successful. They need that if they're going to be on Prop 36 and they're going to need that certainly if they're mentally ill. Mental health case, cases can come in different forms, not only in a drug court setting, but also revocation hearings, probation violations, competency hearings, nonviolent misdemeanors, domestic violence disputes, and uh, uh, incompetent st stand trial misdemeanors where they cannot restore competence. All of those cases just have the same kind of components, same approaches, the same kind of oversight, and the same kind of review to make their cases work well for them. Fundamentally, this is an issue of treatment versus incarceration. Incarceration is expensive, counterproductive, and doesn't do what we want it to do in terms of fairness and justice. Treatment is the way to go because in the end, it reduces recidivism, it helps people be successful, it makes our system work better, it's more cost effective, and it's the right way to proceed going forward. I don't know that my video is gonna work, Indeed, it does not. Okay, but my video uh, was just about a person much like Mary or Marcus who came to the court with a mental health issue. Uh, she was a young lady that I saw in juvenile court. She was about to turn 18, uh, and she uh, had, in fact, a problem with uh, mental illness that she didn't know about. Uh, we diagnosed it after she had failed deferred entry of judgment. Uh, she came to, uh, into court and was able to learn about her mental illness. And from that learning said, gee, I now understand I have something I can't fix. I have to do something different. She was taking drugs and she stopped doing that and she kind of got on medication and she deal dealt with the bipolar disorder that she had and was successful. And, and her success led to her saying, you know, I think now I'm going to go to college because I've learned enough about my mental illness to know that I have it and other people have it as well, and I'm going to try and help them going forward in the future. Um, that's the kind of story that you have if, you, if the system works and the system works well for someone. It doesn't work perfectly for everybody, but certainly it's worth the effort and it's worth the uh, try. Thank you very much. The, uh, you will uh, find, and I'm sure it's on your uh, thumb drive that you received today, uh, a copy of the task force uh, will be available at this website, and, and that is cited on the, on the uh, uh, PowerPoint. It's on the little PowerPoint that you're getting today. So, the, uh, so anyway, and if you have questions about this, you'll also see on there my name and uh, Karen Moan, who's here from the AOC staff today, uh, that uh, will help you with any of those issues as well. We have just a few minutes for uh, questions or comments. I don't think we have any mics out there. Oh, we do. There we go. I, that was great. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. It is. I'm Marvin Souther, the director of LA County Department of Mental Health, and I think in uh, our efforts, I, I, I couldn't think of any of your recommendations that the mental health community wouldn't strongly support. I think uh, the partnership with uh, law enforcement and the judicial system is really become more and more clear and important to us. But I think um, maybe uh, the difficulty that we're going to have to try to manage together occurred in the definition that you described when you were talking about the prison system. It was only the first of those three elements that you uh, described that really are our natural home, and we don't get funding or have the expertise to deal with either TBI or developmental delay. And beyond that, then, there's also even a bigger component coming in many cases, which is the issues related to dementia. So I think those three big elements, dementia, TBI, and developmental delay, if those things are understand, understood by the judicial system to be mental illnesses and pushed into the current public mental health system, the only thing that will happen is the current public mental health system will break and the outcome for everybody will be worse than it is now. So I think uh, 
which is not to say that a solution do doesn't need to be devised for those other three categories. It's just that it can't be us alone right now in the public mental health system. Agreed. Agreed. In fact, uh, I think there's a general understanding that uh, the current funding for all of this is problematic. And I agree with you. I think that, but, but in the end, I think they should be included because indeed those are issues that we need to have addressed. And uh, the fact that they may not be funded at the moment is one of the issues that legislation needs to be addressing in terms of where we go from here. And certainly I'm hopeful that both the mental health directors and the, uh, the courts are going to uh, support legislative changes to make those things put into place. I agree with you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christy Kelly from Lake County. Um, I want to say I really appreciate your uh, presentation today and for letting us behind the curtain of uh, what's happening uh, with the judges. Um, my comment would be that uh, the, what was so helpful to me was it set into context some of the conversations that we've been having locally. And what I would like to ask uh, on behalf of my uh, uh, fellow um, mental health, behavioral health directors is that as part of the training to the judges, if you can ask them as they approach their AOD or behavioral health um, or mental health directors locally, that they set the context as well to say, the reason we're contacting you is because we're getting trained in this way. We are reaching out um, statewide. This is happening, you know, for the people who aren't here in the room today, uh, because in, in Lake County, we've been having kind of strange and wonderful conversations, and I didn't really understand the context of it. And I'm sitting next to somebody from Mendocino County and he's getting a different version of a, you know, new, strange, and wonderful conversations. It really would have been helpful if the judges uh, had, when we sat down, said, this is the context. We're being uh, required to do this. So thank you so much for your work. You're, you're welcome. And uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come today, was to tell you about that, because I have a hard time making judges do what I want them to do, <laughs> as we all do. And, uh, but you now know that there is a rule of court that encourages them to put the protocol into place in your county. And you know that now there's a, a rule of court that requires them to invite you to these regular meetings. So you are going to be armed with that legislation and that language, and you can go to them and say, uh, when are we going to meet? And uh, that's, uh, you now have the context in which it is and, and why, and, they were at the presiding judge's meeting where they endorsed this unanimously. So you have an expectation. And that's one of the things I'm doing here today is building that expectation among you so you can go back to your judge and say, hey, I know about this now. We should be meeting. Uh, I'm Richard Van Horn. I'm formerly the director of Mental Health America of Los Angeles. And the question that was raised for me in one of your slides was, you asked if the defendant agrees to share conservatorship reports with the judge. Uh, for all those people who are in, in full service partnerships under this new California system, m they rarely have a conservator, but case, their case coordinator or personal service coordinator's notes and reports might be equally useful to the judge, so there must be some way to share that inside the HIPAA rules and stuff. It would be a, an adjustment to who got to share what. Yeah, we, uh, we initially wanted that to be mandatory, uh, but in the process of getting the legislation drafted, we uh, ran into this problem with the uh, due process issues and things like that, that we compelled us to say that if the defendant agrees. So that's part of why we had the language created in that way. Hello, my name is Tom Traben, and I help oversee the criminal justice-related mental health and substance use services for Alameda County. We have a, a very dynamic and significant countywide initiative to help build better reentry services of every sort um, for folks coming out of prison and jail and, and coming back to communities in Alameda County. Um, and one of the kinds of committees and task forces that we um, have launched are ones that focus on mental health and substance use services with many law enforcement agencies involved and in our own department. Schedule-wise, um, 
I'd say that of all of the criminal justice related agencies and departments, the one that has the most difficulty arranging their schedules to come are the judges. And I understand that and appreciate that. Um, I was heartened by your presentation today and that we might be able to come to the judges committee meetings. Um, any encouragement that you can convey for um, them to come or a representative of theirs to, um, to ours, uh, and I don't mean just Alameda County, um, would be really helpful. We have sheriff, PD, um, DA, um, probation, et cetera, coming. And um, it's just very important that we're all meeting together and working together. Um, the other thing I want to say just as a pitch is it's very helpful, I think, to our services effectiveness and to the clients when judges through the courts uh, mandate that this or that kind of treatment is necessary, going as far in detail as mental health or substance use. But beyond that, it's really helpful then to let us in mental health and substance use services determine which kind of treatment and treatment combinations we think would be most effective for this or that client. That part is our expertise and we're more trained in that and also aware of, of our capacity um, capabilities, which are complex and our coverage kinds of constraints, which are complex and it's, it's uh, somewhat difficult and mind boggling, I think, for the folks in criminal justice to hear about that complexity. And we're happy to take it from there with our training to, to make those next step decisions. Yeah, I agree, and uh, let me make sure that you understand that we are not going to be making judges experts with regard to mental illness uh, details such as you indicated. We are going to give them a little booklet that talks about jargon so that they'll at least understand what, what the words mean, and we're going to give them some outline in terms of uh, what a DMS uh, diagnosis means and, and those kinds of things, uh, and, and hopefully get them to understand some fundamental things. But clearly what the approach here is to, to get their attention and to get them to recognize that it's an issue that needs to be addressed. And certainly, uh, we absolutely agree that the uh, details of how that expertise should be put into place is yours, not ours. And that sounds wonderful. And if we can help, and by we now I mean our statewide associations, with materials to go through you to the judges about our system and some of the things you just mentioned, I think we'd be delighted to do that. And we have forensic and criminal justice committees that can help. Great. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much for your, for your presentation. It's very exciting. And I just wanted to ask, as a person with lived experience of mental health and substance use challenges and working uh, at a state level on that, uh, it makes perfect sense to me that the case managers that you're talking about might be people who are forensic peer specialists or our case manager, you're, you know, would be pe people who are trained to make those liaisons with the, uh, with the mental health and substance use community that will serve those folks. Also, I do hope that when you, when you start the training of all the judges, that you will consider having a uh, person with lived experience provide some training as well. A specialist who has experienced, um, ha has experienced such as Mary in the criminal justice system and mental health and substance use. Thank you. All right, and we will. Thank you. All right. We're out of time. All right, great. I was thinking as the judge was talking, if we could just clone him, one for each county, that would be perfect. So could we borrow some of your DNA, maybe? Um, so will you join me in thanking the judge? Thank you.